Putting up to it, it's important we look at the facts. Yeah. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Planet Hollywood. I'm Paul Hutchin, political editor of the Daily Record. Joining me in this momentous week are Planet Hollywood regulars. We've got John Ferguson, who's the Sunday Mail's scoop hound. We've also got the Scottish Daily Express head honcho, Ben Borland. So let's just dispense with the small talk. Um, right now we're at a pretty critical time in the future leadership of the country. Uh, John Swinney launched his campaign to lead the SNP this morning and in the last 10 minutes or so we have heard that his potential rival Kate Forbes will not be standing. She's going to be making way for him uh, and backing him in the interests of unity. So um, that, that is literally breaking news. Just coming to you John, what do you make of Forbes' decision? Were you surprised by it? Not particularly, but it's obviously been, she, she, I think she genuinely has been agonizing over this decision for the last couple of days. Um, I, I, to be honest, I think if you weigh it up, if you were on her shoes, she's probably made the right choice. She's still very young. She's got a young family. Um, she doesn't want to be the person to have lost two leadership um, elections, and she probably doesn't want to be the one to lead them into what's going to be a pretty disastrous general election. So I think she's clearly taken a decision that the job's going to come up again sometime in the fairly near future and that it's, it, she's, it's better just to sit this one out. Um, I guess the interesting question now will be whether she does decide to take up John Swinney's offer of playing some kind of Leading role in her in his um, in his government, um, uh, there's clearly a huge division within the SNP that John Swinney wants to heal, and uh, it's you know it's it's very difficult to see how he can do that in a meaningful way. John, just reading Kate Forbes's statement, she said that she'd made the decision after listening very carefully to John Swinney um, and uh, listened to him with great care. It sounds like she's been offered some sort of senior post in the cabinet, which would see her come back to the to the government uh, for the first time since the days of Nicola Sturgeon. Yeah, that's right, and I guess it's just whether she wants to do that. I, th I mean, I think odds on she probably will. But the thing here is that she must know. I mean, John Swinney last time round said that he didn't want to run. He's clearly, he's, it looks like he's sort of been dragged kicking and screaming to the to the role. Um, last time round, he made clear that he thought it was time for um, he, what he called new blood to come in and run the, uh, run the SNP, be the leader of the SNP. He wanted to see new ideas coming through just based purely on the fact that he's ran this time. The kind of, it's it, implicit in that is that he does not believe that Kate Forbes is that new blood that the party needs and that he doesn't think that she would be the right person to be leader, despite the fact that he's going to offer her some sort of big job. Um, so, you know, I think, I think what you can read into that is that he's offering her a big job because he knows that he needs to rather than that he particularly wants to and that um, there, there's, there's still a, a big divide in the SNP between the, I think Kate Forrest would generally be viewed as someone who's more leaning towards the kind of salmon faction of the party that um, there is clearly a huge amount of um, of animosity for within the Sturgeon camp, which is, you know, Swinney and um, um, Mary McCallum and um, Neil Gray and and um, Angus Robertson. So, the, yeah, I think she, she, she'll be offered a big job, but it would be interesting, you know, whether she takes it. And what, I, I don't think she'll be in any illusion as to um, how, others in the party feel about or 
despite the fact she'll be getting that offer. Ben, what do you think was the deciding factor in her decision? Do you think it was maybe she concluded that she wasn't going to win it and that would be two defeats on the trot? Uh, I think probably the, the, the general election might have been the deciding factor. I mean, no, nobody wants to take over and within probably six months lead the party into uh, what looks like it's going to be a fairly disastrous election with, you know, 20 MPs uh, or, or more losing their seats. Labour, all the polls suggest Labour will, will come out as the largest um, party in Scotland at Westminster. I mean, it would just be the, the worst possible start for him. It's, it, it's, it, it's not a great time to be taking over the SNP. I, I think these talks that were held at the Parliament on Tuesday between Swinney and Forbes are, are probably um, more important than this. A lot of people have been saying things this week that perhaps aren't 100% um, accurate. I mean, Kate, Kate Forbes said she decided while listening to John Swinney's speech I suspect she decided on Tuesday when an offer was put to her to say, look, you you, you wait your turn, we'll, we'll get you something now, let's not have... The, the last thing the SNP wanted was a, a leadership campaign, mm. a four-week campaign full of bitterness and division and exposing all these cracks within the party when they're already trailing in the polls. That, that was the absolute last thing they wanted. John Swinney, again, talking about people who say one thing and, and actually demean another. John Swinney actually said, I'm no caretaker. I mean, only a caretaker would say that. It's clear that he's just a stopgap. And once the SNP feels it's in a stronger position, then we'll have a, a genuine leadership uh, contest, presumably with Kate Forbes in it and one of the... Uh, one of the younger generation, perhaps Neil Gray, perhaps Mary McCallum. And, and finally, once and for all, perhaps we will get the, this sort of schism that started between the Sturgeonites and the Salmonites will, will, will finally be resolved. Because as far as I can see, all this has done is kick it further down the road. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure Kate Forbes, A, didn't want to step in at this current time but b has been told look we'll click you know let john take a hit he's he's gonna i i genuinely wouldn't be surprised if there's a another smp leader leading the party into the 2026 holyrood elections ben um, do you know what, is there not a case for saying that this is actually a better day for the smp if you look at humza yusuf's cabinet it was pretty widely panned as not having experience. You didn't have Swinney in there, you didn't have Forbes in there. Yeah, I mean, now, now, now Swinney's going to be First Minister, Forbes is going to be in the Cabinet. They seem to have beefed up a bit. I think, the I think they have, yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't a particularly impressive administration. Uh, John, John Swinney is, is a safe pair of hands. I'm not sure he's the kind of inspiring leadership figure that, that a party would be looking for. But he's it, it, clearly a, a very competent minister. He seems to be from the sort of centre ground of the party. Um, if, if Kate Forbes comes back in, I mean, who knows, Fergus Ewing could even come back in from the cold and try and... I mean, his his, um, his, his campaign launch was, was kind of low-key. I think everyone remarked on that, the, the, the signs that looked sort of homemade. Uh, but, the, but the message on the signs was, was very important. Was it unity for independence or united for independence? Mm. No, it seems to be, let's, let's try and hold this warring party together just to get us through the next election uh, before we can finally decide, right, we, what is the SNP? Um, so, John, just picking that up, I mean, we've spoken about Kate Forbes so far, but... John Swinney is going to be Scotland's next First Minister. So if you look at it in the context of the last 25 years, we had Dewar, Henry MacLeish, Jack McConnell, Salmond, Sturgeon, Humza, and now it's going to be John Swinney. So, I mean, what do you make of that? He, he, he's, he's quite a survivor. You know, he led the party 20 years ago. That was a bit of a disaster. He was an ever-present in the Salmond and Sturgeon governments. 
then we thought he was uh, heading for retirement when he he didn't uh, serve in. So did he? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I mean, what a remarkable turnaround for the guy. Yeah, I mean, but, but I, it seems pretty clear that he would rather not be doing this jobs at the moment. He, um, he's in fact he's he's more or less said that in interviews that he's that his party is in crisis and that it's been made clear to him by colleagues that they believe he's the only guy that can save them um, and that his sense of duty is um, compelling him now to to stand in what almost certainly looks like a coronation. Um, it's, it's got a bit of the feel of when, you know, when Scottish Labour appointed Jim Murphy as leader and they thought all we need is this sort of like a kind of well-known um, safe pair of hands to come in and we'll be able to turn things around. I, I doubt whether it is going to be this like fantastic turning point for the SNP. I think that the problems are going to continue. Um, you, fairly soon, we, for example, we could have a, um, a vote in Parliament on conversion therapy this is going to open up all sorts of divisions. Um, Kate will Kate Forbes vote with the government on that if she is in the government at the time. Who knows? Um, so there's all sorts of, of problems coming down the line that simply changing from Hamza Yusuf to John Swinney. You know that it's not going to solve the problem. There's a kind of narrative forming that Hamza Yusuf was some sort of divisive figure. In fact, I think he was anything, but you know he. Um, did everything that he could to build bridges with other members of the SNP, kind of widen the tent a bit from the Sturgeon years. He bent over backwards, really, to facilitate the Greens, despite the fact that they turned on him so bitterly. So I don't think things are going to get better. And I think, like Ben alluded to, the um, it does feel like the SNP need to have this giant rammy and decide exactly what they are. Are they a uh, sort of party of the salmon geers that focused on the economy and um, independence and sort of the more the basics? Or are they a party that wants to focus on the sort of the gender politics and the well being economy and um, and all the things that they became synonymous with under Nicola Sturgeon. So they've effectively elected John Swinney's kicking that can down the road a bit. Um, I'll but, give you 50 um, quid if you can define the well-being economy. Well, exactly. I think it basically means that um, you don't really care that much about the economy because money doesn't make people happy, allegedly. Yes. Um, s sticking with you, John, I mean, I was there this morning at the uh, the Swinney launch, and I, I thought it was quite impressive. You know, the message of unity, trying to bring people on board. He was clearly reaching out to Kate Forbes. I think that was like the main objective of his speech and the Q and A. Um, I mean, it's going to be very difficult over the next couple of years. Well, firstly, um, whoever wins this contest, and it looks like it's going to be Swinney, he's going to have to win the vote for first minister. Um, so he's got some talking to do at the Greens, but then. Um, when it comes to legislation and the budget, he's going to have to essentially get the support of a, a of an opposition party for every vote. And given how febrile the atmosphere is at Holyrood just now, that, that's going to be pretty difficult, is it not? And so maybe there's a feeling that at this moment in time he's the, the right person for this well, vote? Well, I mean, there is, there is a counter-argument. Like, yeah, he's, I think he's... He's basically the guy that they think the Greens will continue to work with. Um, the counter argument would be that the coalition wasn't going very well anyway, that had Kate Forbes run, for example, or if Humza had stayed in place, you could have got through the vote of no confidence with the elbow Ash Reagan. And um, certainly under Forbes, you could, you, she, you think that she would be reaching out to other parties and possibly just, um, you know, passing legislation that Labour or even the Conservatives, Lib Dems, just couldn't possibly object to. So it's. I, I don't think that Forbes would have actually won the first minister vote. 
I think the Greens would have voted her down. And you might have had a couple of Nats, maybe LGBT members not voting for her as well. Well, that, well, she would have won it as long as all of the SNP members voted for her. So that's, uh, you know, that's... Well, you, I think you need to win a simple majority. So uh, it could have been like, even if it was like 63-63, she, she would have still fallen. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's academic now. Uh, I mean, the, the, I think you have to remember that they certainly, in I think all of the previous leader... The, votes to, to swear up a, a first minister, the opposition parties have abstained. That has been the tradition previously. So whether, whether you know, if, if they decided not to adhere to that this time round, there could have been problems. But in the past, it was accepted that the biggest party got to swear in their first minister and that the other parties effectively voted for the leader, their leader and abstained. Ben, first minister Swinney, do you accept the, the general premise that um, he is more of a centrist than Hamza Youssef, that he'd be more willing to work across the political aisle um, out with the, the Scottish Greens and he might be more of a, a threat to the opposition parties? I think he's a, I think he'll be a better First Minister than Hamza Youssef. Um, I do think, though, he's still part of that, that old guard. I mean, personally, I, I think that uh, the SNP should stick by the principles they have um, outlined so loudly and so frequently at Westminster when a prime minister has been changed. Obviously, we've seen quite a few prime ministers change and each time the SNP uh, it, it made very shrill demands for an election. Um, and, and yet now we're on to our third prime minister of the, sorry, first minister of the current term Two of them have, have never faced uh, the verdict at the ballot box. I, I think the SNP were, were probably spot on when they said, after Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak came in, but when they said that, 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 that you know the, the people of the UK deserved another vote. Um, but I think that's a point. very fair point. I do. I think that's a fair point, Ben. I mean, they, they did jump up and down and call for a, a general election when the Tories were going through... Prime Ministers are right or not, so why would I mean, it be any different here? It's, it's exactly the same. It really is. I think, um, you know, to, to one change of leader, you know, it's, it's not ideal, but this is now the second change of leader. And as I say, there is every possibility that, that there'll be another before the general elect, uh, before the next Scottish election. I, I really think when, when Rishi Sunak calls uh, the, the election, whether it's October, it would be the, the most principled move that the Scottish government could make is say, look, let's let, let's let's hold an election up here as well. Um, ben, um, Salmond, I think he made the point in a, in a piece in the Sunday Mail at the weekend, or maybe it was the weekend before, I can't remember, but he was talking about the minority government that he led back in 2007, where he you know, he worked with different yes, parties and well. budgets. Yeah, you know, you know, essentially that coalition with the Scottish Conservatives, yes. which we don't often hear about. It, it, hasn't politics changed pretty fundamentally since then? You know, the pro-UK parties are much less willing to, to work with the SNP government. It's about bringing them down. And so minority government in 2024 is, is much harder than it is in 2017. It's a completely different prospect. It doesn't have to be, though. The, the SNP could take a step back from independence and say, look, we have spent the past 15 years, probably since the 2011 um, uh, Holyrood election, 13 years of constant independence has been the top priority of the Scottish government. They, they, they could, if, if they had the, you know, the, the nerve to do it, they could say, look, OK, we, we're going to put this... We're not going to drop this, but we're going to move it down the list of priorities. And let, let's turn to the NHS, to education, to uh, local government funding, to the economy, to, to net zero. And those will be our priorities for the next, you know, short term, for the next five years. I, I think they could find ground with the, the, the pro-UK parties. But 
the reason they can't find any ground is, I mean, we saw John Swinney's campaign launch, United for Independence. And once again, the number one priority is independence, even though it, it's as far away as it's ever been. That there's, what that, was yes, Holmes's line? Is it frustratingly close? Did you not say it was frustratingly, frustratingly close? close? What? what? Rubbish. What utter rubbish. It, it would be much closer if they could fix the problems that have been created in in, 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 as I say, in hospitals and schools. I mean, imagine how much easier it would be to sell independence if a and &E waiting times were, were on target month after month after month, if school performance was climbing up the league tables, if people were in, you know, people in Scotland said, Do you know what, the SNP are doing a, a, a damn good job of running this country. Make, Maybe they could do an even better job if it if we were independent. It's almost like they're making the alternative argument. They're saying, "Oh, we're making such a mess of this, but it would all be fixed if we were independent." It's um, it's it's a very strange argument, and it's no wonder that the the pro UK parties won't have anything to do with it. Um, John, let's come full circle. I mean, the reason that John Swinney is going to be first minister, the reason that Kate Forbes is not standing, it is because of the resignation of Hamza Youssef earlier. This week, um, I mean, <laughs> what do you make of the circumstances of Hamza's resignation, which came down to the way he gave the bullet to the Scottish Greens from government and ended the Butte House Agreement? I, I mean, it was an extraordinary uh, couple of days. I think one quite important point to make is that there's been a narrative from actually Hamda himself and others within the SNP that the the big mistake, if you like, that Hamza made was the manner in which he sat the Greens um, calling them in at eight o'clock and um and and sacking them and then they're you know walking out the front door. Um that I I just don't think that's true. I've spoken to people in the Green Party who've said it wasn't the way he did it, it wasn't because their feelings were hurt that they um, that they said that they would back a motion of no confidence against Hamza. It was the actual fact that they had been dumped from government and that the, the SMB had broken up, uh, torn up the Butte House agreement. Um, so, I mean, that the, they are still very upset about that happening and they do not think that that was a decision that was taken by Hamza Yusuf in isolation. Um, there's been a lot of speculation that Stephen Flynn, the Westminster um, leader, had sort of was very in favour of Hamza doing this. There's also questions over whether it was because Hamza felt, you know, he went from one day saying that the the Butte House Agreement was worth its weight in gold to sacking the Greens the next day, and there's is also a question over whether that was because he could see a vote of no confidence in Patrick Harvey coming down the line that many in his own party didn't want to back. So it does look like Hamza was certainly, um, it was a wider movement, though interestingly not a cabinet decision, but a much wider collective decision within the SNP that um, led to the Butte House Agreement being torn up subsequently. I believe that Hamza was extremely open to doing a deal with Ash Reagan to stave his skin in that um, in that vote of no confidence in his leadership. I think the thinking in his camp was that um, the demands were fairly small and that if he could get through that vote, that the Greens would pull in behind the SNP again on uh, issues of policy. Um, the thing so, is, over the weekend, it didn't appear like it was Ash Regan that he would have to be dealing with. It was always the leader of the party, um, A. Salmond, who popped up yeah. um, to, yeah. to give his tuppence worth. And obviously, for some in the SNP, that's like a red rag to a bull. Yeah, ex exactly. I think that is exa exactly what happened. I think that Hamza was um, very happy to do a deal. I think Ash Regan's demands were extremely limited um but and the arms i wanted to do the deal but that other figures within the party had made clear that that was a non-starter you could see 
you know, Liz Lloyd on the TV, Nicola Sturgeon's former special advisor saying it would be a disaster. Um, you had uh, um, Ian Blackford saying it wasn't happening before um, Humza had said that it wasn't happening. And then it, it was interesting to see how the news that Humza was going to resign sort of started leaking out with, I think there was a report from, you know, senior sources that he was considering resigning. I, I, I don't know why you would say that if you were, um, you know, if, if he was still considering it, then just say no decisions being taken. It does feel like he was being actively pushed to the door by his own party because the thought of a deal with Ash Reagan brackets Alex Salmond was completely unacceptable to people with his, in his own party. And so I think what you can read into that is that the SNP is still caught in this um, battle between these towering figures of the last 20 years, Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon. They, um, there's, there's two very specific camps that are, that are um, ideologically different and just for personal reasons there's a massive amount of animosity between them and um, that you know that that fight within the party hasn't been resolved yet and until it is it's difficult to see their their troubles ending yes well um so I think maybe this time next week, John Swinney will be voted in as First Minister. Mm -hmm. That's my assumption. So Ben, let's start with you. Good week, bad week, who you got? Um, well, I've, I've, I've tried to avoid the the obvious. Um, and I'm going to say a, a good week for Douglas Ross, because let's not forget, it was Douglas's uh, motion of no confidence that ultimately toppled Humza Yusuf. It might have been only because the Greens were, were prepared to back it. But, but he, you know, he, he was straight in there, recognised. Um, I, I think he's, he's a much underrated politician. And I think he recognised there was a, a chance here and, and he was straight in and, and um, deserves much of the credit. For, I mean, if, if you think that um, anyone deserves credit, I think Douglas Ross deserves much of the credit for, for Humza Yusuf's uh, resignation. I mean, it might, as you say, it, it might backfire because John Swinney is probably uh, a better um, option to lead the party and the government. But, but anyway, um, it's always good to have a scalp. And a bad week, um, I picked I picked Jenny Gilruth just because over the weekend there was obviously a lot of talk about who could be the next leader, who might throw their hat in the ring. And I, I was just astonished at the kind of derision that when when it was put forward that Jenny Gilruth was considering a run at the leadership, I think from, from from across the board on social media, it was this kind of mixture of disbelief and, and as I say, derision that uh, she might be uh, uh, viewing herself as someone who, who could lead the, the Scottish government. Uh, I may be proved wrong in the years to come, but... Uh, I think of all the unimpressive candidates, she's probably the, the most. So um, I'm going to say Jenny Gilbert. John, who's in the doghouse? Who's um, looking so, at the stars? I mean, I think it's just, just to state the obvious, it's been a bad week for Hamza Yusuf. He's um, he's lost his job. Um, you cannot imagine being dealt a worse hand than he has had over the last year. Um, a, you know, he come in as Nicola Sturgeon's um, successor, it, almost within days, um, she was being arrested by police. There was a huge and you know fraud investigation into the party's finances. He's been dogged by you know just scandal after scandal, which most of which haven't really weren't really of his own making, despite the fact that he didn't do a great job of distancing himself from them. So. Um, I think he will be remembered as a, as a genuine, decent man who wanted the best for the country and was genuinely honoured to get the chance to, to lead the country and in different circumstances um, could have potentially been a very successful and long-standing First Minister. Um, I would say it's been a good week, despite the fact she's announced that she's not running. I think it's been a um, good week for Kate Forbes. Um, I think you know a lot of people were 
really relishing the prospect of seeing her going up against John Swinney. Someone said to me this would be like having a you know a, a dinosaur going up against a creationist. That the first question would be whether Kate Forbes even acknowledged John Swinney's existence. Um, it was, so it would, it would have been great fun to see that contest played out, but she's obviously decided to bide her time and um, and there's going to be a chance in the future. So I, I think she's, she remains, you know, one of the SMP's leading lights and she, we haven't heard the last of her. Well, I have to say, even by Scottish political standards, this has been quite a doozy of a week. Um, it's never a dull moment in this trade, is there? I'm too scared to log on to Twitter in case there's some Operation Branch Fund development or some oh, other thing. Um, but um, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Tune in next week. No doubt we'll be talking about First Minister Swinney and his bold agenda for the people of Scotland. And no doubt um, uh, uh, Douglas from the Scottish Daily Express and Hannah from the Scottish Daily Mail will provide some excellent insight. So Thanks again, and I hope you join us next week. Coming up to it's important we look at the facts. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal.